Okay, so in this screencast, let's have a look at some of the basics of scenario forecasting and planning. Okay, so as we've just said, when we looked at the nature of the sport environment, complexity and uncertainty are avoidable as the scope and time horizon of decisions and planning expand. And you would find that in any industry, but because of the complexity and dynamism of the sport industry, it's actually, you know, really important to, I think, for sport managers to have a good understanding of, um, you know, the, the environment and how scenario planning can help you with the environment. Now, as we've said before, multiple scenarios preserve complexity and especially uncertainty. And the advantage of that is if we plan for multiple or we're aware of the conditions for multiple scenarios, then we're prepared for different conditions if things change. So the reason that SAGE prepares scenarios for the government is so the government can have a plan and contingency plans for different circumstances for the coronavirus. Okay, so that's that's the rationale for um for, for behind um, scenarios. So I think it's important to say that, you know, scenario planning isn't about getting the future absolutely right. Because one thing that we do know is that nobody knows exactly what the future will look like. But the idea is we're talking about some possible futures and being aware of those and prepared of those so that we don't kind of hedge all our, well, so we hedge our bets so we don't put all our bets on one future, on one thing coming off and put our resources or deploy our resources ineffectively and then find that another scenario plays out and we haven't thought about what that might mean and how we might deploy our resources, facility resources, people resources, business resources, whatever it is. So the essential purpose of scenario planning is not to get the future right, but to avoid getting it wrong. A lot of people, or even academic books, say that it's pointless to try to forecast sport because you can't get it right. And a lot of these are kind of scientifically minded people from an econometrics background, um, and they want answers in black and white. And sometimes the answers aren't in black and white, particularly where, um, particularly where the future is complex and difficult. And this is where qualitative forecasting comes in. Um, and kind of plugs the gaps that quantitative forecasting, which wants precise answers um, with small margins of errors, um, where, where it plugs the gaps where quantitative forecasting doesn't really work. Um, so that's that's really what scenario analysis is about. Um, and we're not ideal, we're not designing one ideal future as the focus for planning, but what we're trying to do is define several several different and plausible, not totally wacky, not ridiculous, not mildly feasible, but plausible possible futures um, as the context for our planning. So this actually is taken from a publication by the Australian Sports Commission. Um, it's called Megatrends in Australian Sport, and it looks at long-term trends which might affect Australian sport. I'm not going to suggest that you read that, but it does have this quite nice diagram, which is called the Futures Cone, which is taken from this kind of um, fairly well-known book um, and was developed by a couple of authors, Hancock and Basold. Um, so what we really, is, is, is this is almost like a field of vision, isn't it? It's almost like a physics drawing where you're looking at your eye and what you're looking at in the future. So what scenario forecasting allows us to do it is is it allows us to identify first of all in the broadest sense of 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 terms possible futures okay now possible futures is okay and through scenario forecasting um i will ask you to identify four possible futures four possible future scenarios and then i'll say to you well which do you think are the two most likely the two most plausible things that you know that, that you think that overall there's a possibility that they might come into play and then i might say to well okay well what do you think is the most probable 
and that's the one we can plan for but there are also plausible futures um, and if you look at the, the government forecast for covid um, they look at you know reasonable worst and best case scenarios so reasonable ones where we think you know there's a chance that this might happen and you'll always have um you know doom merchants who say this is going to happen and everyone's going to die and things are going to be awful for years and years and years and then at the other end of, of the scale you might have kind of um, covid deniers who say it's all the government hoax and there's nothing happening well those are both probably you know at the realms of what's realistically possible and we're interested in what's plausible and probable to be able to plan for um i think i've talked about these when we talked about that diagram in the last screencast uh, screencast about kind of um you know static and simple um and and kind of dynamic change and things like that so i don't think i need to talk you through these things but what we're really moving into now is kind of the first steps of how you prepare a scenario approach. And your scenario approach really is based on our, own, our old friend PEST, PESTEL analysis, which you might be sick and tired of. But the good news is in this module, I'm not definitely not going to ask you to um, carry out a deep and involved PEST. In the seminars next week, I will say to you, OK, given what you know about PEST and given what you know about, um, you know, the sport environment, which of some of these factors do you think? Or if we read some, if we read up or think about some of these factors, so again, um, if we read up about some of these factors, what do we think the impact these might have on um demand for sports facilities might be and then i'll ask you well which are the most important so we might look at government sport government policy and what government policy is saying about you know the economy what its policy is towards the economy what its policy is towards um benefits so we know that the furlough scheme is ending and that might cause higher levels of unemployment what impact might that have on sport demand and need what about sport policy? What about national governing bodies? What are they doing and saying? We looked at the example of um, Swim England and their policy for um, their, their policy or their policy document on um, potential decline in swimming pools. We might look at the outlook forecast for the economy and the effect of Brexit and the post pandemic. Is it going to bounce back? Is it not going to bounce back? How quickly will it bounce back? We might look at demographics um, and, you know, the ageing population and what effect that might have. We might look at long term sport participation trends. So I talked to you last week about the decline in formal team sports and the growth in solo life sports um, as society becomes, you know, less focused on rules and regulations as shift patterns means that it's more difficult for us to dedicate our time to train and joining team sports. We want more flexible lifestyle related sports. So, and then technology, we might look at how technology has and will impact on the way people participate in and buy sport products and services and how information technology impacts on the way that sports facilities might be able to um, operate and deliver their services and their products. So all of these things will have an impact on the industry but for a lot of these things there's going to be uncertainty of outcome now uncertainty of outcome can be a bit difficult to explain but i taught this module before covid and i used this slide and i've decided to keep this in so i used to show this to students when we had live lectures in the pre-covid world and i used to say to them what's this and after a bit, they'd say, oh, well, we think it's a virus. Now you'd say pretty well, that's a virus. And it looks a bit like a coronavirus. And, and, and the fear previously was that out of Asia, out of some of these kind of, um, you know, we get bird flu, which kind of jumped from a species into the, into the human species and it spread rapidly and it killed a lot of people. 
And what we said was, because this used to happen every year, there'd be a new strain that came out every year, and we'd say, how many people are going to die? And some people, the, the kind of deniers would say, nobody. And the doomsters would say, it's going to kill everybody. And we kind of said, you know, well, this then is the concept of uncertainty of outcome. We've known for years, and every year, there's a different kind of flu strain or coronavirus strain that comes out, or every few years it comes out, um, and we know that's going to happen. But what we didn't know was, would it make the leap easily into humans? Would it be transmissible? And if it was transmissible, how deadly would it be? And some of those uncertainties create a huge variation in you know, impacts in society. And we used to talk about this, and I naively used to talk about this as, well, if you are planning for public health, you would want to know about this and you'd want to make plans for, you know, what do we do if this is highly transmissible? Um, and what do we do if it's not that transmissible? Because those different things will create different scenarios for you to have to react to. Um, I didn't for a minute think, and I wasn't thinking broadly enough, and none of us were really thinking broadly enough that, well, you know, something like coronavirus could shut down professional sport or spectating at professional sport for years, could shut down sports facilities um, and, you know, create a different kind of demand for sport where running and cycling and outdoor activities um, and solo activities in the home boomed last year and how are they going to recover and bounce back. But the important thing here that I want you to understand is uncertainty of outcome. And some pastel factors, we can be pretty sure what impact they are going to have, what the outcome is going to be of this thing coming to pass. But other things, we really can't be that certain. And at the moment, there are two giant issues, I suppose, affecting life in every sphere in this country. Um, and we still don't know how they will play out in the future. We might be a bit more certain than we were, but there are still major question marks. And some of you may base your scenarios around these two factors. One is the global pandemic. I don't need to tell you how that's turned life upside down um, in the last few years. And will and we'll continue to mean that life is probably not quite the same as it was before, and maybe never will be quite the same as it was before. And Brexit has changed lots of things. So we know it's changing, you know, the supply of certain goods on supermarket shelves and petrol forecourts right now. So Brexit alongside other things is having an impact. Um, and that will have an impact on the demand for sports, goods and services as well, possibly. Maybe not as much as coronavirus and the global pandemic, but it will have impacts on the economy, which will have ripple down effects or ripple out effects on demand for sport. OK, so scenario planning then uses pest analysis with the specific goal of identifying a small number of external environment driving forces that are associated with major potential impact on the business. So when you do pest analysis, and you'll find this in strategic management of sport that you're doing with Mark Taylor. The issue is not that you identify a huge, huge long list of factors. The, 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 the skill is that you identify the handful of the most important factors that are going to become drivers for the industry that are going to affect the industry. So the first thing is we want to identify a small number of pest L factors or pest related factors that have a, a major potential impact on the business and and they're associated with high uncertainty in terms of their outcomes. Yeah. So we know that the, these are the critical uncertainties as opposed to what in some literature is called the predetermined elements. So let's look at two critical uncertainties in recent years. OK. Um, on the one hand, we've got the coronavirus, and we don't know, you know, whether this winter we're going to go back into lockdown and whether that will affect whether sports facilities and other businesses can open and therefore will affect the demand and the supply of those facilities. There's a huge element of 
uncertainty. So they are, you know, COVID is the critical uncertainty at the minute. And there are others, you know, for, for example, government policy into the future about funding for sports facilities. We've seen that Swim England are saying, you know, 40% of swimming pools might close in the next decade. Um, if we don't have certainty about funding and if we don't get funding in place for these. So that's an example of uncertainty, you know, future government funding and availability of funding um, for public swimming facilities in this country. On the other hand, predetermined elements are things which are important, but it's easy to forecast what their impact might be. Yeah, we know that COVID is going to be important, but it's very difficult to forecast exactly what its impact is going to be because there's a lot of variation in what might happen in the future. The ageing population is something which is a predetermined element. We know that the population is getting older and therefore we know that demographic groups that are currently in their 50s and 60s will get older and some of the demographic age groups lower down who are major participants in some sports, they're going to shrink and that will shrink demand in some sports. But we know that that's going to happen. Um, and, and so that makes planning for that a little bit more easy. OK, so predetermined elements, we know they're going to have an impact and we know they are coming in the future, the impact of the ageing population. And that's probably going to have an effect um, in depressing demand for some kinds of sports, maybe high impact, um, you know, very intensive sports. And it might increase demand for, um, you know, for less impact intensive sports. Or it could be that some sports, you know, as the nature of ageing changes, um, people participate longer and where we thought they may have started to switch to other sports they they continue with other sports as kind of healthcare and awareness of fitness and physical activities a lifestyle becomes important but we know that you know we're pretty sure that we can say what the impact is going to be of the aging population now critical uncertainties we've talked about coronavirus we've talked about covid one of the things about the Olympics, you know, as an event, and we've just had an Olympics this summer as well, is that back in 2006, we knew that the Olympics were coming to London. We knew that they would have an impact of some kind, but what would the impact be? Would it be an in inspiration to increase participation over the long term? Well, you know, the answer to that over the long term has been not really. Um, although in the run-up there was optimism, some of it not that wise, that it would, you know, be a major boost to demand. But there's uncertainty there. Do you see what I mean? Some people saying there's going to be a lot of demand, other people saying it's not going to have a real effect. Or was the Olympics going to be a distraction from the long-term challenges of increasing participation and tackling hypokinetic um and tackling hypo hypokinetic disease associated with inactivity. So is it going to be a distraction and could it lead to a decrease in participation? Could it be a drain on the funding for grassroots sports, which means that some community facilities didn't have the investment because it went into the major facilities at the elite end of the sports spectrum and it meant that, you know, the quality of facilities wasn't taken care of um, in the decades from, you know, kind of 2006 to 2020, if you like, because all the money was going on funding and paying off debts that were taken out to build major sports facilities. And that might have been able to fund community sport facilities. So we didn't really know what the impact was going to be. OK, so that's the difference between critical uncertainties and predetermined elements. Now, in screencast three, the final screencast, we're going to talk about how you can use those ideas of impact factors, which are uh, are important and are going to have a high potential impact, but also those which are associated with uncertainty of outcome. How you can use those to try to identify some scenarios for yourselves.